Into the Eye of Darkness, by Stephen Lake. The Guardian Series Part 3 Paul stood quietly on the steps of the massive stone structure that was City Hall, and studied the growing crowds around him. Every year, in this small southwestern town, the entire city came out to celebrate the 4th of July. Literally everyone. Given the number of people that were gathered there, and the ongoing cross-dimensional war that was happening, he had to be extra careful today. This was especially true given that the sheer number of people present made this celebration feel more like something that you would see in a big city, rather than a little farming town in the middle of nowhere. Down on the street below him a group of clowns moved back and forth through the crowds as a five-piece band played patriotic songs nearby. On the other side of the street there were vendors of every type, including several who had food trailers. The smell from this, that drifted his way, made his mouth water. A moment later a tall, light-skinned Asian man named Cho stepped up to Paul and handed him a hot dog. Paul looked at this in confusion. What's this for? he asked. You looked hungry, grinned Cho. Paul laughed, and then took the hot dog from his friend. Surprisingly, I am. But I was actually eyeing that pizza truck over there rather than the hot dog stand, he replied. Well? I can get you some pizza too if you'd like, said Cho. But Paul waved dismissively as he bit down on the hot dog. Nah, it's fine. We can hit up Donnie's later on after everything dies down. And I think you'll like it. They make the best pizza in the area, he replied. And how do you know that? You don't live here. Paul chuckled. I tried some of it while I was scouting the town yesterday during our prep time. It's not bad stuff if you want to head over there later on. Cho nodded. I might just do that, he replied. The two men then stood quietly on the steps of City Hall and studied the large crowd of people gathered there. As they did, Cho took in everything that was happening around him, and was utterly fascinated by it all. Your patriotic celebrations are intriguing. I find their exuberance quite entertaining, he said. Paul laughed. Yeah, they tend to go all out for the fourth around here. But, if you think this is something, you should come by later tonight. They're going to have quite a fireworks celebration. Cho laughed. No thanks. I've seen enough fireworks in my life. You must remember that I grew up in China. We celebrated with fireworks nearly every day of the year. I doubt there's much you can do to top what we had. Paul laughed. Probably not. But hey, it's the thought that counts, right? Just then a brilliant ball of light appeared in the sky above the city's clock tower at the far end of town and bathed everything in a powerful, blinding white light. Paul immediately shielded his eyes in surprise, and then turned his attention towards it. He wasn't sure if this was part of the city's 4th of July celebrations, or something more sinister. Focusing on the light that was blazing above the clock tower, he was surprised at how painfully bright it was, and yet it didn't change any of the shadows around him. Wow, what's up with that weird light? Cho, do you see this? he asked. But his friend didn't answer him. He then noticed that the entire town had fallen silent. Dead silent. Looking around him, he noticed that everyone appeared to have become mesmerized by the mysterious light that was blazing above the clock tower. Even more interesting was how all their eyes seemed to fix to the light, and yet they showed no signs that it was hurting them. He found this odd because it was definitely blinding him. A few moments later the people began walking towards it like moths to a flame. What in the world are they doing? he thought. He then turned to see what his friend thought of this, but saw that he was nowhere to be found. Cho? Cho? Hey, buddy! Where'd you go? he shouted. But he got no answer. He then reached out with his senses, but couldn't detect him anywhere. There wasn't even evidence that he'd teleported out of the area. It was as though he'd simply vanished without a trace. Paul soon turned his attention back to the light as his eyes narrowed. Wait a second. Something's not right here, he said suspiciously. He then walked down to one of the people on the street, and asked, what's going on here? But the man ignored him, instead acting like a mindless zombie, his only thoughts and intentions being to walk towards the light. 
Paul shook the man to wake him up, but it was no use. He then put his hand on the man's forehead and tried to read his mind, but found nothing. His mind was totally blank, as though it had been completely wiped of all cognitive thought, reason and logic. In its place was one singular, solitary command. Walk towards the light. That didn't seem right. He then reached over and activated his communicator. Central, this is DB05631 reporting in. I've got an incident underway at my location with some kind of strange light appearing over the city clock tower that's hypnotizing everyone. I also seem to have lost my partner, Cho. He's vanished without a trace. Please advise. However, he got no reply. He again repeated his message, but still no reply came. Okay, what's going on here? This isn't right, he muttered with concern. Just then Paul spotted something that made his heart leap with surprise. As people drew close to the clock tower they were sucked up into the light, one by one, like dust into a vacuum cleaner. This terrified him. Whatever was happening, people were being abducted. Wanting to save as many lives as he could, he raced down to the street and tried stopping them. However, nothing he did had any effect. So he began grabbing people and flying them out of the city before returning for more, starting with those closest to the tower. As he was doing this, he spotted Cho and among the crowd of people and realized that he too had been hypnotized. Paul immediately raced over to his friend and tried to grab him, but found that his hands went right through him as though Cho had become nothing more than a holographic illusion. What the heck, he said as he blinked in surprise. He then looked up at the light above the clock tower again and wondered why it had affected everyone else there, including his partner, but not him. However, for the moment, that didn't matter. He first needed to act quickly and save everyone. To protect his eyes from the light, he pulled a pair of sunglasses from his shirt pocket and put them on. To his dismay, the sunglasses had no effect. His eyes narrowed again. Whatever this is, it's not natural, he thought. Tossing his sunglasses aside, he exploded upwards towards it, in an effort to confront the brilliant, apparently ethereal object in the sky. However, as soon as he touched it, he was repelled violently backwards, through several nearby buildings, and into the city's historic tree, shattering it to splinters. Paul quickly got up, brushed himself off, and studied the carnage. Man, whatever that thing is, it ain't playing around, he thought. He then looked back at the tree he just hit, and frowned. The mayor ain't gonna be happy about that, he groaned. He then teleported himself back to the ball of light over the clock tower and fired several powerful energy blasts at it. But they were immediately repelled back at him. Instinctively he reflected the shots back at the sphere of light, which then sent them back at him in return. This quickly turned into a high-energy game of ping-pong as powerful, Devastating energy bombs bounced back and forth repeatedly between the sphere and Paul. Eventually realizing that he couldn't keep this up, he deflected the sphere safely away from the area and off into the distance. He then floated over to the sphere and studied it closely. There had to be a way to stop this thing. Needing to get a better view of it from the other side, in hopes of finding a weakness in it, he slowly floated around it until he spotted what appeared to be a black gateway behind it. This intrigued him. He'd only heard about these things before, but had never seen one in person. Is that an eye of darkness? Well now, that explains a few things. It also explains why they're using this orb of light as they're trying to hide what's really there, he thought. He then generated a powerful energy bomb in his hand, and shoved it right into the eye. To his surprise, it didn't affect it. The shot merely evaporated on contact. Has it already grown that powerful, he wondered. He then activated his communicator, and said, Central, this is DB05631. I have an eye of darkness right in front of me. My partner is down and I'm unable to do anything to it. Please dispatch reinforcements immediately. Again there was no reply. He hoped beyond hope that communications hadn't been taken offline, or he was in a lot more trouble than he wanted to be. Deciding that time was essential, as lives were at stake, he collected up as many people as he could, and moved them outside the city. 
but, to his dismay, those he'd rescued earlier had already begun to walk back towards the city. So he gathered them up again and took them further away. Satisfied that he'd saved everyone he could, he returned to the brilliant orb of light. All right, time to make this thing go away, he thought. He then gathered up as much energy as he could into his body, and unleashed a devastating barrage of fire right into the eye. But just as he did, his entire world went black. The next thing Paul knew, he was awakening from unconsciousness with a pounding headache, as his body ached all over. Curious to what had happened, he was surprised to find himself buried partway into a rocky hillside several miles away. He groaned in agony. Apparently he'd been counterattacked so quickly, and so powerfully, that he hadn't seen it coming. Okay, felt that one, he moaned as he struggled to extricate himself. He quietly shook off his feelings of disorientation before kicking off the ground and floating up into the air. He then looked off towards the nearby town and noticed that both the sphere of light and the eye of darkness were gone. He wondered what happened to them. He soon noticed that all the people he'd saved earlier were gone. That didn't sit well with him. Deciding he needed to look into this more, he teleported himself back to the city and grimaced slightly at the effort. He quickly drove the pain from his mind as he scanned the area. To his dismay, all that he found was a handful of people who were running around and looting everything in sight. Normally he'd rush down and arrest them on the spot. But that could wait for later. Right now he had bigger fish to fry floating over to the clock tower he noticed that the time was now 12.15 p.m. It had only been a little after 12 when all of this had started. This meant that only a handful of minutes had gone by. That was promising in and of itself. Deciding to scan the area for more clues, he reached out with his powers and immediately cringed as a sharp, fiery agony screamed through his body. He grit his teeth painfully as he scolded himself for doing this, given his current condition. Ugh, heal first, fight second, stupid, he groaned. After taking a few moments to mend all of his ailments he turned his attention back to the clock tower. Man, whatever hit me earlier really messed me up. With an eye of darkness present, I'd better play it cool because those things ain't no joke, he thought. He again reached out with his powers, and soon detected a portal right in front of him. Deciding he needed to investigate it in the safest way possible, he summoned a small, round sphere that looked like a floating eye, and sent it through the portal. Normally he'd just rush through one of these portals without thinking. But, given what had already happened, he decided it was best to play it as safe as possible. He then closed his eyes and connected with the sphere. What he saw on the other side amazed him. The world around the sphere was filled with pure, unadulterated blackness punctuated by towering columns of flame that illuminated what appeared to be a sea of desiccated bodies. It was like he was looking at hell itself, only more surreal. Well, well, well. It appears that we may have finally found the center of this madness. And, if that's what I think it is, I'm going to need backup to take it down, because there's no way I'm going to take that on all by myself. One beatdown for today is more than enough, he said to himself. Just then a gigantic mouth appeared out of nowhere and surrounded the sphere. Within a split second the image changed from fire punctuated blackness, to the ooze-filled bowels of a monster. Paul disconnected from the eye and grimaced. Yeah, didn't need to see that, he muttered. He then activated his communicator again, and said, Central, this is DB05631. If you can hear me, I need reinforcements to my current location, and a lot of them. I've got an open portal here to what I believe is their central base. Please advise. However, once again there was no reply. So either his communicator was broken, he was being jammed, or there was literally nobody left at Central to answer him. He narrowed his eyes at this. The longer this went on, the worse it would get. Deciding that it was best not to allow the portal to close, he summoned a gateway wedge, a special energy tool designed to keep portals open, and shoved it inside. Once satisfied that the portal was secured, he reported back to Central in person, and discovered that they hadn't received any of his messages. But, it wasn't because his communicator was broken. They just never arrived. 
returning several hours later, with a group of forty other guardians, Paul was shocked to see that everyone that had vanished had somehow suddenly returned. This made absolutely no sense. I thought you said everyone had vanished, said one of the guardians. They had. Literally everyone, including my partner, just up and vanished. Trust me, I'm not lying to you, protested Paul. The leader of the other guardians studied Paul for a moment, and then the city. Despite what I'm seeing, I believe you. Even so, we need to go have a look at that portal of yours. If what you're saying is true, we need to deal with this quickly. Paul nodded, and then led all of them to the clock tower. However, to his shock and dismay, when they arrived Paul found that his brace had vanished. It was soon spotted a short ways away laying on the ground. If the brace was there, then it was clear to the leader that the portal Paul had told them about it also once existed, given the used appearance of the brace. While it's no longer here, it looks like you were right, and that portal did exist. However, there's still a lot of other unanswered questions that we need to resolve. Everyone, spread out and scan the city. Let's see how many clues we can find to help us solve this mystery, and stop that eye of darkness, if we can find it, said the leader of the reinforcements. The others immediately obeyed and quickly spread out as requested. As they did, Paul, and the leaders of the reinforcements, began to examine the clock tower. However, search as they might, it was as if nothing had ever happened there. This is concerning. Given the presence of your brace, and the other things I'm seeing, I believe your story to be completely true. And yet, I'm not detecting any sign of portal activity in the area, either past, or present. It makes no sense. It's like none of what you said happened, despite the obvious evidence to the contrary, said the leader. Paul nodded. Yeah, I know. It doesn't make any sense to me either. But, since there's an eye of darkness around here somewhere, we need to solve this mystery quickly before things get out of hand. The leader nodded. I agree. So let's start by debriefing the crowd. They're bound to yield us some useful information. And, if not, then we'll spread out from here. If the monsters of the other dimension are making a new push into our world, then we need to be running point on this to ensure that they don't get another foothold in our world again. Paul nodded. Sounds like a plan to me. The two guardians then floated down to the street and began to move about the people there in search of answers. However, as they did a dark, evil, swirling vortex like I watched them from a distance, and was not pleased at what it was seeing. We must stop them before they uncover our plans. If we do not conquer this world, and take its energy, and resources for our own, we risk dying, it said. A few moments later a red, sphere-like eye appeared next to it, and said, do not worry about them. Steps are being taken to eliminate the threat they present. Proceed with the mission as our Supreme Lord has commanded. Yes, Master, said the black, vortex-like eye. It soon shimmered and vanished. As it did, the red, sphere-like eye turned its attention to the group of forty-one guardians nearby as they swept the city. It then let out a low, evil chuckle as the citizens of the small town suddenly transformed into rexes, and other monsters from the dark dimension. It then laughed with evil satisfaction as a massive, ground-shaking fight of biblical proportions erupted in the nearby city. Fight all you want, guardians, but this world will soon belong to us, it gloated.